Welcome. Good afternoon. It's already afternoon here in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. Um, I know that you're out there watching on Facebook, on YouTube, and on the Institute's page, armenian.usc.edu. That page will be up uh, regardless uh, if other pages don't stay up for any reason. I'm, I can't help but say that you know, when we started the Institute's Outward Facing Programming five, six years ago, we insisted that all of our programming would be streamed around the world because we believe that the words of the scholars that we are able to feature, government officials, journalists, analysts, are important, and they're important for all of us around the world. We didn't know at the time that that was just preparation for 2020 and the year of COVID. 2020 continues to be a year of surprises when we first began to plan a series like this, not much different from what a university extension series used to be. We started thinking when the fighting in and around Davush broke out in late July. And at the time, we were thinking of calling this Armenia and Azerbaijan, we're not paying attention. Well, things have changed. Uh, 12 years ago, 12 days ago, it feels like 12 years, 12 days ago, this became Armenia and Gharapar and Azerbaijan at war. Today, there are thousands dead, thousands displaced, and international media is there. Vice Media just released a report just a couple of minutes ago called Living Under Life Under the Bombs. Uh, foreign ministers are meeting, I think, still right now in Moscow. This is a complex situation, not just what is happening right now on the ground in and in the surrounding territories and in Armenia. It is an old uh, conflict, but there are many things that it is not. This is an area, the Caucasus, that has sat at the corner of three empires forever. It was the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire. Today, it's Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Nevertheless, in this area, dozens of different ethnic groups have lived together in fluid movements with fluid borders for a very long time. As the policies of the empires changed, so changed the fate of the people who live in those areas, including Armenians, including Azerbaijanis. With the Soviet Union, Gharapah, was placed under Azerbaijani sovereignty, even though it was majority Armenian populated. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, as many republics and autonomous republics tried to determine their own future, so did the Armenians of Gharapakh, saying that for, for human rights and other reasons, civil rights, cultural rights, they wanted to be either independent or associated with Armenia. That was the beginning of a military conflict. The response was violent, and the conflict lasted until 1994, until a ceasefire that has since then largely held and been self-monitored, which is rather unusual in the world. How that has happened, why that finally broke, those are all the topics of our conversation today. I do want to say a couple of things about what um, scholars, analysts, people on the ground, including government officials, are quick to say. There are several things that this conflict is not. It is not a religious conflict. It is not a conflict between Christianity and Islam. It is not a conflict where Turks and, and Azerbaijanis hate Armenians and have always hated them for generations, nor is it that Armenians have hated these peoples, Azerbaijanis, Turks, for generations. That doesn't mean it's been a comfortable, easy relationship, but it isn't about hatred. It's about the way in which populations are li living, in which they're allowed to live, and in which the powers that are in control deal with their populations. The other, things, um, the other thing that this conflict is not is that it's not about territory. It isn't territory from the Armenian side. The Armenian side has secured 
the safety of Gharapov and the territories around it for security purposes. From Azerbaijan's perspective, it is about territory because Gharapov and the ter ter territories surrounding it comprise about 20% of what Azerbaijan considers its sovereign territory. And so this, this conflict, what it is, where it might go, is what we're going to try to talk about today and find possible answers to. That's what scholars do, and that's what we've asked our guests today to do. Let me say also that I recognize that there is a structural program in what we're doing here today, in that um, there are no Azerbaijani voices. We will try to present the Azerbaijani perspective, however, in this lecture, in this conversation, it's not a lecture, in this uh, conversation today, and in the conversations to come in the course of this series. The first speaker is Robert Avedisian, who is Gharapal's permanent representative in Washington, D.C. He's been in that post for about 10 years. Prior to that, he was in the foreign ministry of Gharapal for about 10 years. And today, and I don't know if this was planned or not, but he is in fact in Stepanagird, and that's where he'll be speaking with us. So here is Robert Avedisian, and we're really very uh, grateful to you, Robert, for being available to us. It's midnight in Armenia and Gharapal, and uh, you've had a 12th hard day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, I don't know about a pleasure, but thank you for being here. Um, I want to laugh at the set that we've chosen here for me, because for me it really is just a set, these old bricks. You, however, are sitting where exactly with those bricks around you? Yes, the reasons are pretty different. I want to thank uh, South EU, the USC, and the Institute for putting this important discussion, very timely discussion. Uh, no, the conditions, uh, the circumstances under which we had to relocate to another uh, location was out of security concerns, of course, because the entire city of Stepanakert has been bombarded for several years with uh, days, some days hundreds, some days tens of, of long-range missiles. So we accommodated and tried to do our best to uh, continue our uh, agenda in foreign policy work and our part of the fight uh, in, in better conditions. The, the, situation, um, the situation as we hear it is obviously um, limited uh, in terms of uh, the front, the uh, numbers of attacks, the numbers of uh, lost soldiers, casualties, numbers of wounded, numbers of displaced. What can you say about numbers, even if they're not absolute numbers? What can you say in relation to other situations? Numbers in, in everything, this, this uh, flare-up, this war is very unprecedented. Not only for Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, but uh, Artsakh-Azerbaijan conflict, but also for the entire region as a whole. This region hasn't seen this active hostilities for decades at least. It is unprecedented in the number of victims. It is unprecedented in the number of uh, weaponry and the quality of weaponry used uh, from the both sides. And it is also unprecedented by the players who are hands-on and who are involved directly into the Artsakh and Azerbaijan uh, war this time. First and foremost, of course, I mean uh, Turkey's role, which uh, if it is, has historically played a kind of behind the scene a player of the situation in Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani foreign policy. Now we see pretty much boots on the ground, command and control by Turkey. Air uh, command was delegated to Turkish uh, commanders. And the, another, the most dangerous. How do we, we know, know it from We know it from uh, visuals, which are very open. We know it if we analyze the uh, chronology that slightly a month ago they had military exercises, joint military exercises, and half of the military equipment, including F-16s, uh, remained in Azerbaijan. Then later were uh, used to for bombing our civilian communities in Artsakh. And we also know we can we hear what uh, what signals are coming from Turkey. If the rest of the world has been signaling since the day one to stop and to try to 
uh, restore uh, relative stability and try to resume negotiations. It was only Turkish government which was backing Azerbaijan and not only backing but instigating it to continue attacks and that's literally what was being said, to continue attacks until the uh, goals are achieved. Do we know what those goals are? We can, well, if, if we again analyze, yes, as Armenians we know and it comes from history, uh, but uh, even now uh, if, uh, even Independent if we don't know that Independent of the historical story, baggage, the, the, what is yeah. happening, the strategy that you were observing? Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is one of the situations that we cannot disconnect from the history. As, as if the people who have been subject to the genocide by the Ottoman Turks, we see that history repeating not only on the battlefield, but also on the political field. And the uh, Turkish president, when he says that we are going to finish the mission of our forefathers and restore our presence in the Caucasus, um, I mean, it's a clear signal that uh, the aggressive exp expansion is, is, is still part of the foreign policy of Turkey and is as aggressive as it was in the early 20th century towards Armenians. Now the danger is the internationalization of this conflict because Turkey is using also its connections in northern Syria and Libya to pour the uh, vast amounts of, uh, of, of mercenaries from terrorist organizations there. And that's also confirmed, the fact has been confirmed by uh, the intelligence services of the major political and uh, security players in the world, United States, Russia, France, Great Britain. It has been covered very widely, uh, widely uh, by the mainstream international media around the world. So that qu those questions are out of doubt. Uh, I, there is no doubt about it, unfortunately. How much of what Turkey is doing, do you think, is part of their own national interest and also their bilateral relationship with Azerbaijan? And how much of it is, you know, if Russia can come into Turkey's backyard in Syria, well, why can't Turkey come into Russia's backyard in the Caucasus? Is that even a, you think that's a motivation? I don't know what is the motivation in Azerbaijan and in Turkey, but all we care about is the security of Artsakh. We don't want Turkish uh, troops to instigate Azerbaijani attacks on us. And again, we want Turkey to join the international community to cool down the hotheads in Baku, not to do otherwise. That is our concern. And uh, we uh, really, this conflict is spilling out of Artsakh-Azerbaijan confrontation into the fight of Artsakh against the international terrorism. This is a completely different paradigm. This is a completely different, uh, pregnant with pretty different consequences for the entire region and the civilization as a whole, as our civilized world. Uh, talk about the evacuations, please, and what that means. On the one hand, the security of the people involved. On the other hand, the message that that gives. There is no any planned evacuation of the peaceful population. Uh, although this attack started at 7 a.m. on Sunday, and hundreds of missiles, if, if not thousands of missiles, they begin to fall over all over the uh, sleeping cities, the major uh, settlements and smaller communities all across the Republic, including Stepanakir, the attack drones, Kasirga missiles, Lora missiles, all those huge uh, Balanez, et cetera, et cetera, and um, military aviation, the jets. There are people who prefer to relocate for security concerns, and they're free to do so, be it in Artsakh or uh, go to, to their relatives in, in, in Armenia or elsewhere, but there is no any centralized government effort to evacuate the peaceful population. I can assure you that most of the population, for instance, in Sipanakir, they are still in the basement. Maybe part of the story is also that we have seen this for the third time. I mean, we have been, for three times, at least in my lifetime, we've been subject to uh, this kind of behavior and this kind of treatment. Uh, we already um, kind of accommodated how to survive in this uh, situation. And we, want, we know that the enemy's program was to instigate panic in, among the peaceful population and to take all the uh, major uh, civilian infrastructure out of order. But apparently they failed also on that. There is no panic. People just know how to relocate, how to hide from bombs and how to stay there. And uh, we hope that this will help us to diminish uh, the uh, number of uh, victims among civilians. But unfortunately, we have them. Victims among civilians. Yes, we do. We do at least uh, more than 20. That's, that's a confirmed number of uh, people who were killed uh, by, by, by those rocket missiles and uh, more than 100 
are uh, wounded and we don't know the fate of those, uh, the eventual fate. How, how, what is the recovery process will be? I asked you what you think the goals are on the Azerbaijani-Turkish side. What is Gharapal's goal? If what would, what is ideal for the Republic of Artsakh? Uh, the short term, the medium term? Short term, medium term, and long term, we want stability, we want peace, and we want to live in our homes. That's it. Nothing extraordinary, nothing uh, maximalist. No. We don't want what doesn't belong to us. We want to live in security. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We want not to be afraid for sending our kids to school. We want not to be afraid to make plans. We want to have access to water. We want to have access to all the benefits of, of the modern life. And we want to feel secure. That is it. What is the plan of Azerbaijan and Turkey? Again, you can you can judge uh, on the statements by coming from the two capitals. Uh, that the messages is, are very clear. They they are even suggesting as a humanitarian corridor to leave uh, our homes now. That was the latest uh, statement from from Azerbaijani president. They say we can leave the corridor. You can leave. They want Artsakh without Armenia. That's obvious. Uh, they they will try to kill us. If no, they will try to scare us so we leave and they're even ready to provide what it, what it is they see as a humanitarian corridor because the whole road from Artsakh to Armenia is, is being shelled now by a long range missiles. I don't know uh, what they imply by that. Which road? That's the it. southern Artsakh road? Without Armenia. All the roads, the entire infrastructure, even the one connecting Artsakh with Armenia, the ones, the two roads, uh, the northern route is too dangerous up until now because of the, um, the most effective uh, and deadly thing is the attack drones, which have been uh, purchased and stockpiled by Azerbaijan for many years with easy oil money. And that also raises the question of, of the responsible arms trade, because it is one thing when you trade in a peaceful time, but it's an absolutely different story when you trade arms, attack assault arms with the ongoing uh, active phase of hostilities and such a big human, uh, human tragedy. It's ironic, right, that there are rules for war. Our, one of our next guests, that's one of the things we want to talk about with Steve Swerdlow, who'll come on next. Um, Robert, I remember in the old days, uh, there were always stories that, you know, the, the front line and the two front lines facing each other, that, you know, the Armenians and the Azeri soldiers would trade cigarettes. You know, that was the, the story about how this is a stable, non-peace, non-war situation, and that there mm -hmm. is conversation, dialogue between the sides, whether at the soldiers trading cigarettes or at the higher level of the, you know, the local commanders. Is there any sort of conversation today? You touched a very important segment of all this. Starting with trading cigarettes or uh, settling the international issues, it implies negotiations, and that implies direct contacts and staying constructive in a constructive manner. The most effective uh, period of our settlement process including, inc included Artsakh as an immediate party to the conflict, meaning that Azerbaijan was talking directly to, to us, Baku, Stepanakert contacts were, were very frequent and very effective. Since 1998, Azerbaijan refuses talking to us, and this is how we step by step aggravated into the situation when in parallel with Azerbaijani, so it is tightening their grip on the civil society, and virtually uh, demolishing it in Azerbaijan, they now control what Azerbaijani society is listening and hearing about Armenians. And all they hear is hatred, that we are aggressors, that we occupied our own homes, uh, that we are comers to the region in the 19th century. Uh, also, there are churches which have been established in the, in the first century uh, AD. So there is a clear... Uh, linkage between the uh, lack of communication, absolutely no track to diplomacy. There is only hatred towards Armenians. There is always, uh, and, and it has been taken to the state policy, unfortunately. And that was one of the subjects which we are trying to uh, pay attention to and, and focus the attention of the international community to break the barrier between our peoples. Talk a little bit about how it was before 1998. When you say there were contacts between Baku and Stepanagert, that seems like ancient history to the rest of us. 
it was up, it was thanks to those contacts that we ended up with a ceasefire in 1994. Artsakh is one of the co-signatories of the trilateral ceasefire, Azerbaijan and Armenia, the two other sites. It was uh, the success. Another success was that was uh, of that was uh, the uh, um, signing an agreement on. Um, joint kind of examination and prevention of any skirmishes or any violations of the ceasefire regime. And there were also contacts between the NGOs. We had mutual visits, we had negotiations in, in, on, on all levels, including on the public level. And that allowed to somewhat uh, break the uh, situation and to somewhat improve the image of Armenians, bring it a little bit closer to the real image of Armenians. Image among the for whom? Society. As perceived by whom? As perceived by Azerbaijanis. And what about but the unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, the same goes for the reverse. I mean, if you cannot, if you analyze you or any of your uh, listeners, if you analyze the, not of course during these 12 days, but if you analyze our curriculum, the school curriculum, if you analyze our daily media, we never call them like the perpetual enemy of, 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 the, of the Armenian people. And in return, we hear Ali's statement that Armenians of the world are the enemy number one. We never say that we are not ready for a dialogue. We never say that we're not ready to extend our hand again, even being subject to so many aggressions. We know that all the conflicts end eventually with peace, and we feel that we need to do whatever it takes not to deepen the gap between us by such decisions to attack us again, but to bring the, closest, uh, bring the parties closer. My last question is exactly about that, that uh, several things have happened. First of all, these years of, of no interaction. Second, this situation now has obviously raised nationalist, patriotic nationalist uh, feelings on all sides. There's absolutely mm -hmm. no question about that. And the losses will further aggravate the patriotism, nationalism, depending on who you're talking to and how it's perceived. How does one go from that to a peace that will necessarily require compromise? I think everything will be worse than it was except for uh, Azerbaijani president's uh, further strengthening of his domestic power. And that's a big component in all this. We need to make sure that Azerbaijani leaders stop using the conflict with Artsakh for domestic political reasons, to justify their human rights shortcomings, their economic problems, not to distract the attention from domestic problems by instigating uh, or at the expense of our security. We need to see a better involvement of the international community and calling the spade a spade. We, we, we have enough of this uh, constructive uh, ambiguity. I, I have absolutely a different uh, opinion about the uh, efficiency of using constructive ambiguity. It's never constructive, especially in the conflict. We need to make sure that, just like you say in the United States, that uh, there is an inevitability of responsibility. Every action should bear its responsibility. There should be a remedy. Yes, there should be a remedy. There should be political consequence. Of course, there should be political consequence. Until then, we're going to try to do our best and our army will prove it on the battlefield that we're ready to take care of our fate, but we're waiting and the world in the 21st century, the civilized world is expected to take a much more firm and much more active stance in all this. Thank you. Before I let you go, can you give us the number of casualties at this point? Uh, number of our casualties is uh, 320 uh, soldiers died. It's not the final number, of course. The fighting is happening right now as we speak. Uh, on Azerbaijani side, we don't have any number and nobody does, except for probably a couple of uh, officers in the uh, defense ministry. I hope that their president knows the real number because he's a politician who has never been involved in any sort of uh, military uh, experience. That is also one of the reasons why he's so easy to jump into war. He doesn't know what war is. There is no any number from Azerbaijani side. The thing that we saw on the ground that our uh, reconnaissance or interceptions of communications is well above 4,000 for Azerbaijani army. And there is, a, of course, a, also a military explanation to that because attacking force pays much more than the defending. I uh, don't know whether I wish I understood war better or I'm glad I don't. Um, thank you, Robert Avedisian, for taking time out 
at this time especially. Were you planning to be in Stepanagar or was this just odd irony f fortune? I was planning. I was actually when I boarded the plane from Washington DC to uh, Yerevan, the connection flight was in Doha and in the air all these things began to happen. But of course when I came to Doha my old plans to stay and work in Yerevan for uh, certain reasons changed and I joined my uh, MFA family as soon as I could. Thank you again. Um, we wish you well. We wish everyone well and we wish peace. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. There is a lot there to unpack. Some of it we're going to try to unpack now with two um, specialists. I, I think that uh, the speakers that we have today fit uh, the needs of some of us to really try to understand this better. Our next two guests are Steve Swerdlow, Esquire, who is Associate Professor of the Practice of Human Rights in the Department of Political and International Relations at USC. He is a human rights lawyer and expert on the former Soviet region. He was Senior Central Asia Researcher at Human Rights Watch. He has worked as a human rights monitor in the Caucasus as well as with the International Organization for Migration in Russia and other international organizations. Steve's CV is long. He has conducted human rights investigations in the Caucasus specifically, most prominently conducting field work in Azerbaijan as well on freedoms including freedom of expression. Our my second interlocutor in this next segment is Emil Sanamian, who edits the Focus on Gharapakh portal on the Institute site at armenian.usc.edu. And he's written about politics and security in the Caucasus and the wider neighborhood for quite a while. His articles have appeared all over the place in Jane's Defense Weekly, The Economist Intelligence Unit, Foreign Policy, Open Democracy, Civil Net, Eurasian Net, and elsewhere. Emil was born in the then Soviet Baku, capital of Azerbaijan. He is the authority on military developments, diplomatic developments of these 30 years, and he is the go-to source for information on a broad range of perspectives on the conflict. Both Steve Swerdlow and Emil Sanamian are on Twitter, um, and they're here now with us to carry on this conversation about Armenia and Azerbaijan at war. Greetings. Greetings. I'm not asking you guys how you are, okay? Um, Steve, let's start, please, uh, talking about war and the rules of war. And I know that that sounds to those of us who are not experts in this field like a silly, dumb question to even talk about. But there really is humanitarian law. There really are rules of war and there's a reason why the International Court of Human Rights called on everybody to um, effect a ceasefire immediately. Talk about that please and then I want to ask you about things like humanitarian corridors, about what Robert Avedisian just said about uh, the number of uh, casualties and the requirements for announcing them, sharing them, not sharing them. But let's start, please, with this, this humanitarian law concept and what is and is not doable. Yeah, and, and thank you, Salpi, for having me here for this conversation. That's true. Exactly what you said is right, that even during armed conflicts, even where you have questions of whether uh, two recognized states or other entities are fighting, regardless of those conversations and those questions, international humanitarian law applies. There are rules in armed conflict. And the key to this is that both Armenia and Azerbaijan are signatories to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. And this state very directly and simply that in armed conflict, you must, under all circumstances, refrain from targeting civilians and distinguish between civilians and civilian uh, infrastructure, water, electricity, food, and military objectives, such as military personnel. That has to be taken in, into account every single moment during a conflict. And stepping over that line puts you in the, in the territory of a war front. What about the numbers that uh, Robert Avedisian was talking about, about knowing or not knowing numbers of casualties? And why is that important? 
we, you know, I think that's precisely why in the in the last few days we've seen the OSCE and also the, the International Committee of the Red Cross really underlining that first and foremost, they want to see an immediate cessation of hostilities and immediate ceasefire, and really quite you know ominously and 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 uh, you know makes one sick to your stomach. But but the main, one of the main reasons for that is to first of all be able to simply go to the battlefield and recover bodies and actually evacuate them, and, and that is a, a situation that is very urgent. And so that primary concern has been voiced by several international organizations, um, and. Yes. I want to bring Emil in. I just want to say a couple of things uh, that may or may not be obvious. One is that the International Committee for the Red Cross is, I think, I think the only international organization that is mandated to be in Rarapaq. All the other international organizations that we all think about, the United Nations, Council of Europe, European Union, none of them are allowed to be there, have embassies, representations, none of that. Um, OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, I really want to get back to, but hold that thought for a second. Emil, do you want to jump in here and also share with us, is this the first time we've been in a situation like this where civilian um, targets are, you know, seem to be fair game? What's been the, the history here? It's not, it's not the first time. It's, uh, it's, fortunately, it's been uh, the hallmark of this conflict that, uh, you know, civilians are attacked. Uh, that uh, civilians are targeted uh, directly. And uh, if we look just at the previous major flare-up, which of course does not compare to the current one, the one in 2016, uh, it was much more limited. It only took four days of real fighting, but in that short period of time, uh, an Azerbaijani army unit managed to go into just one house in the, on the outskirts of one village and killed everybody who was there and disfigured their bodies. And there were other event, other cases where you know bodies of soldiers were disfigured and uh, beheaded. Uh, so this is a hallmark of this conflict. It's become an established part of this uh, repertoire of this fighting. Uh, and fortunately, uh, efforts by uh, the local authorities, by Nagorno-Karabakh government and the Armenian government to try to involve uh, more international human, human rights organizations, you know, the, the names that are no normally cited, the Amnesty Internationals and uh, Human Rights Watch, etc., to come and, uh, I remember uh, the ombudsman of, uh, human rights ombudsman of Nagorno-Karabakh actually coming on the tour of the United States trying to, uh, you know, bring in those organizations into Karabakh to, to have them on, on location. Uh, have not been uh, successful and you know of course all these organizations they have uh, you know different limitations in terms of how geographically present they can be but uh, we can we can also notice that you know there's also a political sort of uh, uh, effort to stay out of the human rights issues concerning uh, the conflict directly uh, you know their amnesty and human rights which and others uh, followed events with the regularity, human rights violations in Azerbaijan domestically or in uh, Armenia domestically, but when it comes to issues arising from the conflict, they're much more sensitive and they try to sort of shy away. And uh, uh, prior to a uh, statement that Amnesty issued uh, just a few days ago about cluster mun munitions being used against civilians in Spanakir and other places in Karabakh, uh, we haven't heard from Amnesty many, many years in terms of things happening in Karabakh. Steve. And that's just the, hum the IGOs. If we talk about the OSC, there's been a conservative effort by Azerbaijan by Jenny government to shut out and restrict Let's leave the OSC for a minute because I think that is a whole discussion because it goes to <laughs> negotiations, uh, inefficient negotiations, unproductive and uh, all of that. Hang on to that for a second. Steve, jump back in. I know you were talking to Ardak Beglari on the Rarapar Ombudsman just a couple of days ago um, and also about this business of the absence of human rights organizations in an area whose where the whole conflict began with issues of human rights abrogations. Yeah, no, and this this, has, this is a multi-layered discussion. And let me start first by um, giving a shout out to my former colleague Georgi Gogia at Human Rights Watch, who really is the expert on the region. I am not, but in terms of this issue of access, I think we need to separate right now the international humanitarian catastrophe and access, which has been asked for by, I know several human rights organizations have requested access and accreditation to visit the Azerbaijani side of the line of contact, and it's very doubtful, um, probably unlikely they'll get it. Um, I do believe that obviously we see journalists um, traveling to, to, to Nagorno-Karabakh and, and documenting what's going on. Um, 
So that is very important that we get immediate access for human rights organizations, journalists, and that they're protected and not targeted, as we've also been seeing, unfortunately. Um, but I, I did have a chance to speak with Artak Begladian, and it is, I think it's a very important observation that the civil society in Nagorno-Karabakh, then the institution of the Ombudsman for Human Rights is actually, I don't know if the word is, that is a very constructive voice and in that very he important exists voice. At all. Both that he exists and also in future um, plans for peace and dialogue and discussions on moving forward. I think it's a very helpful institution. And uh, I, I was interviewing him while he was also in, in a bunker yesterday. Um, but I, I think it's very important that you have a civil society which is sophisticated uh, inside Nagorno-Karabakh, which needs to be uh, very much part of, of the discussion. And there should be documentation. I agree with, with, with you, Emil, that there should be documentation of human rights issues uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh as well as uh, in the domestic context of Azerbaijan and Armenia. But one more point on that, if I may, is, you know, I don't want to, uh, I want to, uh, I think we should be a bit sympathetic to our colleagues at human rights organizations who have been absolutely overwhelmed by the immense crackdown on human rights inside Azerbaijan for the last decade. We've seen you know, day after day, hour after hour, the detention of so many activists, so many people that are also relevant to this discussion about peace, being intimidated, being imprisoned, being silenced. I'm um, thinking of you know the writer Akram Ailisli is really relevant, but that is taking up so much energy and attention from uh, I think human rights organizations that that uh, that could be a, a big reason why we see the focus there and not um, inside in the Gorno Karabakh. Well, this is a great uh, a great not a distraction, but you know stepping off the agenda. But I know that the the obviously both the author the book is one of uh, Emil's favorite topics. But Emil, put that in context, please. And then also, um, you two tell me up to this point we haven't shown a map, but I'm thinking that perhaps it would be useful to show a map, both because it puts the 2016 conflict um, location in place and the line of contact discussion. So maybe we'll do that in a minute. But Emil, talk please about the book. The, uh, give us context. Who is he? What was the book and what happened? Uh, well, uh, Akram Ailisli is, uh, uh, is a fairly well-known writer in Azerbaijan until uh, he became uh, politically dissident. Uh, he was part of the official curriculum. Uh, he was at one point member of uh, Mili Majlis, which is selected by the ruling party of Azerbaijan, not, you know, the for, for formal election. So, yeah, so he was uh, uh, an established figure. Uh, but he remained a, a dissident voice on this uh, sort of uh, warmongering and hate, hate mongering uh, towards Armenians. And he wrote this uh, very important work, uh, you know, about the history of uh, anti-Armenian violence in, in Azerbaijan. Uh, and of course, he was ostracized. Uh, you know, he was, uh, his children were punished for what he wrote, etc. So, I mean, his books were burned. And uh, uh, to this day, he effectively lives under a, a kind of a house arrest. He cannot leave the country, uh, you know, can't do anything public, etc. So, uh, and this man is not 22 years old. No, he's over 80 years old. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, he might he comes from uh, Ordubat, and that, that place is known for uh, you know longevity. Uh, but in Nakhchivan, but uh, I mean, he's he's in advanced age, of course. And uh, I, you know, I can only uh, uh, you know uh, well, guess how his health has been. Yeah, his health 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 has been affected over the years. So um, yeah, I mean, there are very few voices like that. And uh, since the start of this fighting, I've heard of just one uh, former from a former political prisoner basically speaking out against the war and literally hours later police showed up at his door and arrested him so uh this is uh, you know this is one of the political prisons who was just released last year on amnesty so um overall you know the patriotism and the sort of like war uh ethos overtakes a lot of people and it's very hard to remain uh sort of principled in your position uh when it's just it becomes an orgy of violence you know um again before we get to osc and negotiations let's push this a little bit the fact that a democracy lobby and a peace lobby or a no war lobby at least uh, either are prevented from existing or even when they are able to do some things in Azerbaijan can't do it together uh, or worse are at odds you know where the democracy lobby and the peace lobby are at odds what does that do to the possibility even of dialogue and dialogue at any level huh? i'm not counting on dialogue at the 
you know, the official levels just yet, but the rest of it, well, how this contradiction between seeking democracy and seeking peace, how does that influence the situation? Steve, you're nodding. Well, no, I just, I, I want to, without creating any false equivalency, because we're all clear here on the dire human rights situation inside Azerbaijan, I do want to just, again, start by reminding us that human rights law applies both to Armenia and Azerbaijan. First, we were talking about the laws of war, humanitarian law. International human rights law also applies, and it means that any voices or journalists, uh, people speaking about peace and humanizing the other side that are subjected to harassment need to be protected um, and and prevented from from that sort of harm, which we do see happening online. We, Twitter didn't exist in 1994; it does now. So that applies to uh, Armenian society as well as Azerbaijani society. But I, I'm I'm nodding because I believe that you know what was so tragic in the last decade of watching the crackdown in Azerbaijan very closely is that it's precisely those those voices that were the most experienced and the most qualified to advance a peace dialogue, such as uh, my friend, the scholar Arif Yunus and his wife, Leila Yunus, the human rights defender, or even the journalist, Rauf Mir Kadyrov. These were people that were systematically picked off, uh, imprisoned, um, and, and really um, pushed completely out, as you, as you mentioned, from, from, to migrate, from the conversation, yes. from the society. And they, you know, that, that is incredibly relevant now. Still, we see that I think there's a direct connection between the crackdown on human rights and the inability to, to forestall violence at this stage. Those things are connected, and I think that requires all interested parties and international players to put a greater emphasis on protecting human rights everywhere. Emil, do you want to add anything, or should we move on to the OSC? Um, well, I, I, having this opportunity, I want to ask uh, uh, Steve a question, whether he thinks uh, the current situation uh, calls for some kind of international tribunal uh, over uh, this, uh, the war crimes that are being perpetrated right now. I mean, I'd start by saying that human rights organizations aren't saying anything until they get access and they can verify and confirm what's actually happening, especially, you know, we see the the, again, another violation of human rights law is the, the blocking of access to information and to alternative information. And we just don't have that access at this time. I don't think that we're at a stage where those investigations have happened that you could then collect the evidence and present it to uh, the International Criminal Court or other relevant bodies. I think it is very good that, um, as Salpi mentioned at the beginning, that Armenia utilized its, its uh, the interim measures of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, of course, troublingly, we've seen that Azerbaijan hasn't been uh, upholding those judgments as they've come down over the past few years. I think those mechanisms need to be used to the full. Uh, but I think it's early to talk about, um, you know, real evidence of, of, uh, of, of or let's say, of, of arranging a, a case at the ICC. That, that's a very high burden. I think that part of what is going to really complicate this process is now this targeting of cultural institutions, uh, religious institutions, the church, and it's almost as if it's uh, intentionally preparing a path to, a path that is irreversible, a path to non-dialogue and conversation. Because at best, it seems, what might happen is a ceasefire, hopefully sooner rather than later, which will then be followed by dialogue at, if not the highest levels, not at the levels of the president, prime minister, but you know, ambassadors, diplomats, but not amongst the people. Um, it's almost as if we are trying to prevent that even being possible by uh, inflicting deeper wounds and you know, really picking at these scars. The people who were the peaceniks, those who sounded the naivest when calling for peace, understanding compromise and all of that, now are being uh, cornered in a way that you can't talk about peace if this sort of violence, specifically distant violence, continues to take place. Where do we go from here as a next step, people to people? 
The OSCE, will, I still say, we'll get to. We have five, six minutes. We'll get to. But the people-to-people <laughs> -people level, how do you even begin to rebuild that at this point? Uh, Salpi, if I may, I, I think you start by uh, supporting and amplifying the very courageous voices that have been stepping out there. I've seen them on Twitter, such as the activist Arzu Gebula, uh, and also on the other side, Ani Bogosian. I saw this amazing thread the other day um, uh, from her uh, highlighting in Central Asia, my favorite place, how uh, you know Uzbeks uh, would see here and say, "You're either from Baku or you're from Yerevan. I'm not sure which." Um, and, but you know, but it's the same to me. And and you know, and, and Azerbaijanis and Armenians being able to uh, you know live together in, 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 harmoniously in, in many 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 contexts. I think we start with trying to stop uh, methods of dehumanization. Uh, I talk about it from a perspective of human rights law again, Article 19 that protects the freedom of speech and assembly, association, expression actually, and that includes again, prevention of, of this kind of harassment. So I think that's important. And I think from there, um, you try to apply human rights and humanitarian law, make sure that, of course, there has to be there have to be international organizations that are engaged in this. The U.S., we haven't mentioned them yet much. Um, Washington, Nothing to Brussels. mention, so we can leave it alone for the wa uh, for the moment. Right. Uh, both uh, right. both they, Washington they, and yeah. Brussels, nothing to say there. The silence has been overwhelming. Um, Emil, let's talk about the OSCE. You followed the negotiation process forever because it has lasted forever. Um, what have you noticed over the last two-ish years, three, four years that have been that's been different? Well, we had the uh, international uh, context of erosion of all institutions, international institutions, you know, pretty much every major institution is in some kind of trouble. And the OSCE being a, a peculiar organization uh, where decisions are taken by consensus, uh, you basically have, uh, you Which know, means any anybody one country, has a veto, right? Yes, yes. Anyone, any one country able to uh, basically shut down offices and, uh, you know, programs, etc. And that's what Azerbaijan has been doing. First, they shut down the OSCE office in, in Baku. Then they shut down the OAC office in Yerevan, uh, even though it didn't really concern the conflict. Or it was uh, it was an office with bilateral, or, you know, domestic issues. It was all the uh, human dimension you know. issues, not at all the yeah, security yeah, yeah. issues. Yeah, so uh, and, you know, ever since 2016, we had this long drawn out uh, debate uh, that uh, occurred about uh, reinforcing the OAC mission for Karabakh. Uh, initially, Azerbaijan agreed to it and uh, disagreed on the, on the modalities. It was never implemented. And of course, there was a change of government in Armenia and uh, basically that issue went away. And currently, and actually in the past six months because of the pandemic, there's not been a single OAC uh, monitor. Area. And I think that's uh, if it, you know, probably could not prevent this, but I mean, at least it could have been some, some for some mechanism that would be, that would that would have been in place. So there are two um, assumptions in what the, you've said. Yeah. I, I want to back up just a minute before you go forward. We've just made two assumptions. First of all, why are we focusing so much on the OSCE in this conversation? And second, talk about what those monitors have in fact been doing over these years. Well. Um, the, I'll start with the monitors. I mean, it's uh, it, it basically no. was a foundation. Yeah, it was a foundation potential for potential larger scale observer, permanent observer mission or, you know, some kind of peacekeeping mission. Uh, of course, th they only showed up every couple of weeks or maybe every month at different locations at the front uh, of the line of contact and sort of like, uh, you know, compared, uh, you know, watches and, and went away. They didn't stay permanently. They were based in Tbilisi. But uh, that still was a foundation for a potential peacekeeping mission that, you know, theoretically is still there, but in practice is not. As far as the OAC track uh, at large, the reason OAC became uh, the mechanism for this, I mean, part of the reason was the OAC originally was created as, as a way to bridge uh, the gap between West and East, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, during the Cold War. And as uh, the, the Soviet Union fell apart, as the Warsaw Pact fell, fell apart, uh, there was an effort to reinvigorate it as the, as the mechanism for resolution of all these kind of disputes in the former Soviet space and uh, the former Eastern Bloc. So uh, initially, as the conflict was underway in the early 90s, it became sort of an appropriate uh, appropriate uh, mechanism uh, for the parties to to sort of negotiate uh, through, and the United Nations gave the main mandate to the uh, first CSC uh -huh. and then became OSC. Uh, so that's that's been the case, and we have three out of five permanent UN uh, Security Council members co-chairing uh, this format. So it's it's kind of 
hard to find the other States, higher Russia, profile and France. Yeah, United States, Russia, and France higher profile sort of countries to to negotiate. You know, Iran cannot replace that kind of a negotiation format, or I don't know, Turkey definitely cannot replace it because now it's the party to this conflict. So uh, this OAC format, uh, you know, has been maligned and uh, disagreed with, etc., and obviously does not satisfy. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, fail to prevent what we're living through right now, but uh, that's basically the default mechanism to go to if there is another uh, round of negotiations uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan and uh, on the Karabakh issue. So, Steve, what do we do with this seemingly uh, contradictory situation where, on the one hand, uh, everyone, analysts, journalists, and certainly the parties on the ground, uh, at least the defending parties on the ground, are calling for international mediation, the international community to call for a stop. And at the same time, we have these international institutions that really are weakened to the point of, let me say ineffectiveness, you can say worse if you'd like. No, it, it really is um, a, the, a combination of, a confluence of really terrible factors with COVID-19, with where the Trump administration is in terms of its multilateralism or its lack thereof. Um, and as you know, Emil very expertly laid out all the problems of, at the lower levels of the OSCE, we also have this spectacular um, sort of beheading, I should say, of the four, of four senior leadership positions at the OSCE this summer, which again, relevant to our discussion and the connections between human rights and this conflict, it was Turkey, it was Azerbaijan, and it was Tajikistan, three states that lodged, that blocked effectively the reappointment of the head of the Office of Dem Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, also the representative of freedom of the media. And they were specifically exercised about the fact that criticism of their human rights records could be aired in the form of the OSCE. So that, uh, that decapitation of the top of the OSCE has really left it um, in a terrible position. And I think what we need to see is a very creative gathering of all the strength we have uh, all the allies there can be, there needs to be, this is a wake up call. I mean, we're, people are dying literally as we speak and it requires, I think what it requires greatly is the State Department and the European Union to press really hard at this particular time on the OSCE and on all mechanisms that exist to reignite this, this negotiation and, and eventually hopefully peace process. As they say, from your lips to God's ears, um, because it really is a, a, a situation with no other way out. We need the international community, and the international community isn't quite there to step in. Um, Steve, I'm going to say thank you to you and uh, invite uh, Anna Ohanian next. Steve Swerdlow of the University of Southern California Department of Political Science and International Relations, our colleague down the hallway when we are at USC, which is not what the case has been this semester. But um, thank you, Steve. And uh, I know this conversation will be continued in various forms. And as we say goodbye to Steve, I want to introduce Anna Ohanian, who will be joining us next. Uh, Emil Sanamian stays for the rest of this conversation, because as I said, he's institutional memory and, and, and many other things. Anna Ohanian, hi Anna, is Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College in Massachusetts. She is author or editor of several books, most recently one entitled Armenia's Velvet Revolution, which she co-edited with Lawrence Browers, who will be a guest in this series of conversations in a few weeks. Dr. Ohanian is a two-time Fulbright scholar, and her scholarship explores the regional dimensions of armed conflicts, as well as regional approaches to security provision and conflict management. Couldn't find a better way to talk about today's topic. Anna, welcome. Thank you, Salbi. Anna, you heard uh, the conversation with Steve. Um, my first question to you is going to be about democratization and militarization. And you can answer that or you can you know, piggyback on some of the things that's been said before you came in, if you'd like. My question about democratization and militarization is the following, that with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, these entities in the region, the three of them, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Gharapah, chose to democratize or not. Uh, and 
Today we are at this place of heavy military conflict. Uh, life and death existential, it's been called. From here on, there will be some sort of movement forward. And this, just as that democratization or not process impacted our getting here in the first place, this situation, this militarization, this conflict, this war, is now going to impact democratization going forward or not. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, it is one of the major debates, one of the most central questions that is defining my field of study, international relations. And it has been um, heartbreaking to see uh, some of these trends and patterns that as academics we study in a somewhat trying to be neutral and detached, trying to observing all of this at the micro level, at the level of people, at the, just seeing the casualties, which is heartbreaking. But let me just say that uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, with any formation of any new state, security is definitely a question because the new states in general have weaker capacities of governance. In the specific case of the region, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, brought these 15 republics, um, and George, um, uh, uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, in a way, were struggling from similar problems of nascent new, the nascency of the state, the new statehood, but they were born into conflict, both states. As, as you mentioned already, the conflict was in the twilight, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict built in the twilight years of the Soviet Union. So from the beginning, the conflict has been a very significant, highlighted this challenge of security and democracy. Uh, after a few years of some liberalization, this uh, choice uh, was essentially people found themselves in this uh, uh, sort of tension, whether, and it was really very quickly seized by the political elites on both sides in using security to slowly close the liberalization window, the openness that was there. So both countries, similar to much of the post-Soviet world, very quickly devolved into authoritarianism, while the oil factory in Azerbaijan has been significant because it nourished Azerbaijan authoritarianism and turned it into a typical petro state. So Azerbaijani authoritarianism has been one of fully consolidated. Armenia's authoritarianism has been soft authoritarianism and to uh, very quickly to highlight why that is important is that that softness of that authoritarianism allowed, uh, played an important role for the Velvet Revolution in 2018. And let me just say, uh, since we are uh, on this topic, the state of democracy in all three countries within the region are deeply intertwined. State of democracy and chances, actually prospects of democracy for Azerbaijani people uh, are deeply intertwined. Studies demonstrate that um, uh, Democratiz the chances of democratization are regionally conditioned. And one particular study that I find fascinating and really relevant for South Caucasus is the fact, and very applicable for the Velvet, is that in a region when the two country when the uh, democratic poll in a region strengthens, meaning you have more democratic uh, countries mm -hmm. than authoritarian, that obviously creates pressure on the authoritarian state to move, to reform. Now, the in the case of the Velvet Revolution, this was a very important opening. I cannot stress this enough because the Velvet Revolution created this democratic dyad and it, there was a path for managing security in this context. But Azerbaijan, Aliyev regime in particular, offset this. This was uh, essentially, instead of following the path towards democratism, I'm sounding naive when I say this, uh, but uh, uh, activated the authoritarian coordination with neighboring Turkey. Um, and also, militarization, yeah. And also allowed this sort of uh, collaboration, alliance, and this sort of war where the risks to his population, not just to the Armenian population, are great. Because that internal voice 
that needs to be there to object, to rebel, to not go along with a military approach to security isn't there. Now, absolutely, absolutely. Now, the reason uh, I keep yeah, wanting ahead. to go back to this democracy is because I think it's an obvious point that we sometimes forget. At the end of the day, the reason for a state to exist, for a government to be there, is to work for the prosperity and security and well-being of its population. And we in the 21st century have come to believe democracy is that path. Absolutely. But if you live in a demo authoritarian society, the government gets to decide uh, what is the national interest, what is a security, what is security. In the military, this, uh, looking at the region uh, in my scholarship, I uh, do think that authoritarianism, Azerbaijani authoritarianism of the Aliyev regime is one of the major obstacles to the peace processes. That is not to say that Armenian government post velvet could not have been more proactive, uh, but I think there is a conflict of interest and your previous speakers did a wonderful job in highlighting the conflict of interest. For any peace process to work, uh, obviously people to people contacts are needed and who are the people? They are the civil society. So promoting peace building calling for people to people contact in without uh, not expecting some openness in the society as opposition parties are being jailed is unrealistic. Emil, is this a conversation that is that will seem uh, badly timed at the very least, if not absurd at this time for people on the ground in Armenia and Gharapah? Or is this a well, conversation uh, that must be had? I think it must be had because we are uh, definitely seeing some consequences of Armenia's uh, revolution uh, today, uh, these days, uh, in terms of the Armenia-Russia relations. Uh, we, we, we have discussed this issue in general in broad terms about the uh, you know, correlation of security and uh, democratization. We have, uh, uh, you know, actually the Soviet, former Soviet republics are rich in counterfactuals. You know, we have uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova that have had security territorial issues but maintained an element, sufficient, substantial element of demo democratic uh, institutions, you know, change of government via elections. And then we have really kind of peaceful countries like Belarus and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, well, Turkmenistan uh, that have had just terrible, uh, you know, uh, dict dictatorships, even though they have no uh, seemingly uh, present security challenges. In Armenia's and Azerbaijan's case, uh, certainly uh, these countries are smaller and uh, the, 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 the security challenges are sort of all-encompassing, they're identity-forming. Uh, and uh, of course, in the process of uh, government, uh, you know, uh, regeneration or government change, uh, these issues are, you know, in, in the center of, uh, of everybody's attention and everybody's basically judged on whether, you know, they've succeeded or uh, failed on, on Karabakh. So uh, we've had uh, the revolution in Armenia, we had the change of government, and uh, now I'm sure after, you know, after all of this, people will come back with questions uh, whether Armenia uh, was in a better shape uh, confronting this challenge from Azerbaijan because it had a revolution or in a worse shape because it had a revolution. Uh, oh, no, can I jump, jump in, in on that? Yeah, yeah, I kind of course. have to push back a little on Emil, uh, 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 with all due respect. Um, I think the, in terms of changing the uh, strategic implications of the Velvet Revolution, it achieved several things. Number one, because it, was, uh, it came about through bottom up through people power, it provided the Pashinyan government with the political space to achieve certain maintain certain uh, strategic distance uh, with Russia, both Armenia and Azerbaijan in this region and Georgia as well. They have their external uh, dragons, right, that, they, that, that they're struggling to tame. Uh, and I think after the Velvet Revolution, uh, Nikol Pashinyan's government uh, worked specifically, uh, kind of worked that balance quite, quite well. So in that respect, uh, I think uh, Armenia should be credited for adding to the regional resiliency of the region as a whole uh, because it strengthened the capacities of self-governance and maintained, established some distance with an external power. 
So the fact that that opening was not used, we could discuss as to why that is the case. In regards to execution of war, there are studies, uh, and I uh, hate to be citing them, but democracies tend to be more effective in fighting a war uh, because they're more transparent, number one. They rely on international institutions. They're well, more, uh, governments are more legitimate, so they mobilize people more effectively. That's Emil's yeah. point, right? That at the end of the day, we will see in Armenia's case if all of that, in fact, was brought to bear. You know, since we're going down this road, although I really want to focus on Russia and Turkey in the session next Friday. But since we're going down this road, let's also talk a little bit about not just um, the failure of international institutions to feed, nurture, grow the negotiation process, but also what is sometimes called the uncertainty, the, the, the messaging that has been absent um, from the Armenian side and in a very different way from the Azerbaijani side. That the Azerbaijani side will you know, talk sometimes about negotiations and the rest of the time about cleaning out the Armenian population. But from the Armenian side, that what the Armenian end game has been, what the Armenian ability to negotiate and compromise has been, has been unclear for certainly two years and possibly for longer than that. Emil, do you buy that? Um, yeah, I mean, we've, uh uh, we've had um, we've had a challenge, uh, overall challenge of Russia and Turkey increasingly becoming author authoritarian states. Uh, so certainly uh, that's been uh, a major regional trend. It's not uh, something that events in Armenia or events in Georgia can really stem. Uh, you know, and if our if our countries. goal in this discussion and generally is peace in the region, is that going to help us or not? Uh, it could act in different ways, but certainly so far it's acting in ways that, uh, you know, with the, with the Western disengagement, uh, they're making things worse. I mean, there, whatever deterrents uh, that were in place in the past no longer function, and Turkey does not feel like, uh, you know, uh, there are some restraints on their actions, uh, direct actions against Armenians. So uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, an evolving situation, but the precedents that have been set, you know, the, the, all of the lines have been crossed. And uh, we, you know, what we still mean? hear from what Russia. What do you mean? Uh, well, the directly, uh, for direct participation of Turkey in, in the fighting in terms of the, you know, Turkish Air Force, in terms of bringing a mer large number of mercenaries from Syria into the Caucasus. I mean, this is totally unprecedented uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this part of the world, at least for the past two decades. I mean, there were some incidents during the first Karabakh War, too. But, uh, uh, but this, is, uh, this has evolved into, uh, into a situation where the, the part of this part of the Caucasus is being sort of dragged into the Middle East and sort of becoming a continuation of this uh, you know, Middle Eastern, uh, you know, arc of, uh, I don't know, you want to talk about arc of terror or arc of instability, but uh, certainly this is, this is what's, uh, what's underway right now. On the um, civil society organizations, the place of democratic processes and institutions in whatever is going to come next, if whatever is going to come next is a ceasefire that will then, if it's going to hold, have to lead to dialogue, conversation, compromise, settlement. Where do these democratic processes that at least in Armenia and Ghadapak exist and are solid, civil society, civil society organizations, where do they fit in what comes next? Um, there are different ways of thinking about this moving forward. And you were mentioning as to how uh, difficult, how cornered the peace activists are, people who are talking about peace and compromise. I think one of the conversations to be had is the strategic value of peace. Um, in a frank discussion as to what are the strategic advantages, that disadvantages. A conversation? Absolutely, because, because there's such a thing uh, as a disadvantage to peace. No, but I think you will. It is important to convince many corners in Azerbaijan as well as in Armenia that uh, military consolidation, ending a war through military consolidation is not uh, is not a best outcome. There is an academic debate that is em emerging on this, comparing the 
war termination through military consolidation versus peaceful settlement, negotiated settlement, and the impact, needless to say, of militarized victory consolidation erodes, deepens authoritarianism. And Azerbaijani people here start to lose, start to, uh, from if military uh, uh, consolidation, military victory, uh, quote unquote, is the outcome for Azerbaijani side, if. Now, in regards to uh, peace, uh, civil society, to actors and thinking about a peace process. The prior peace process, your prior speakers and Emil have commented effectively uh, as to what the shortages were for the OSC in Minsk group. Uh, so, uh, various civil uh, track two contacts have been sporadic and uneven, not scaled up. Uh, track two has been totally disconnected from governmental conversations. But moving forward, there are several ways of thinking, layers of thinking about this. Number one, the temptation has been, and maybe it's more relevant now than before, to think of a peace outcome as a peace agreement as a big bang. There has to be one agreement, and then we'll work in that framework. Um, studies show that sustainable peace agreements uh, tend to be inclusive, they tend to include civil society, they tend to be reciprocal, they tend to be institutionalized. All of these factors that I mentioned take me back to authoritarianism in Azer in, uh, inside Azerbaijan. This is Aliyev's war, and I'm not underestimating the extensive war rhetoric that agree, uh, exists within Azerbaijani society. But this is Aliyev's war, this is the Erdogan's war. So pushing, but, do we have to be realistic how we build a peace process in an authoritarian setting? To be fair. That's, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, sorry. That's a very good point that this is Aliyev's and Erdogan's war. And with Erdogan's involvement, we have uh, a huge disruption of the, the balance of forces that had been in, in, in place over these years. That's why we have this war. Uh, because, uh, you know, Erdogan was uh, able to insert himself into this without being checked by any other power. So unless you have uh, another power comparable checking uh, Erdogan, you won't be able to restore some element of stability to be able to have that peace conversation. Two Absolutely, I agree. I think, deft, uh, uh, I think deft geopolitics here needs to be combined uh, with very skilled diplomacy in rebuilding a peace process that sticks. Wow. Rebuilding a peace process. Two cautionary notes here. One is that it may very well be Aliyev's war, but we should not forget or underestimate that the identity markers within this conflict that are important to Azerbaijanis everywhere are part of what is going to make this a very difficult dialogue and settlement process because it really is not just one-sided. The second thing is I want to uh, simplify on uh, what you said earlier because it goes to the heart of all of the rhetoric that is out there, social media, the press, you said military consolidation. Now, that is not equal to peace, is it? Military consolidation means we won for whoever gets to yes. say that. Okay, That's that right. is not necessarily the same thing as peace. That may be a cessation of hostilities for X period of time. But military consolidation in any of these studies, does that equal peace? Do you, can you Absolutely say we won not. and therefore there is peace? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, a military and victory consolidation through military means will, in this particular case, will maintain this regional fracture, will be draining the economies of all conflict. Uh, even cold peace is not a good arrangement. Uh, studies show that negotiated peace agreements are have the best developmental outcome. They tend to last. Uh, militarized outcomes tend to, again, uh, not stick. Then tend to, uh, the, there is a cycle of, very vicious cycle of violence that will be you created. Can, you can imagine that, that I'm going to say that's a perfect place to stop because that really is a perfect place to stop. Um, at least this one conversation, which I hope uh, opened windows, doors to topics that we don't usually get to talk about because these 10, 12 days truly have been unprecedented, uh, surprising, I don't know why, uh, but they are, and um, here we are. 
This is a conversation that took place this Friday today and will continue for the next four Fridays. And we will be discussing different aspects of this co uh, conflict, uh, hoping that we can continue always to speak about the peace factor. I want to thank Anna Ohanian for participating. Um, Anna, you're always great and always available. Thank you. Uh, Steve thank Swerdlow you. as well. Robert Avedisian, who I suspect could have been doing a few other things today in Stepan Aged, but chose to join us. Emil Sanamian, I'm leaving to the end because A, uh, well, thank you, Emil. Can't imagine doing this without you. And B, Emil will be back with me next week as we discuss Russia and Turkey. Uh, friend or foe, we called it when we first began to conceptualize this. I think we would have called it something else if we were to do this today. But nevertheless, here we are. Please tell your friends that this, uh, the recording of this conversation is available forever, we hope. Facebook, tw uh, YouTube, and on the Institute site. We also have the Focus on Gharapagh section on armenian.usc.edu that Emil Sanamian edits. Uh, and there are daily updates as well as four years of analyses of what is a complicated topic. I know that we skirted some issues today. We'll get back to them. I know that every now and then we were kind of talking to the people who know what we're talking about, and we will be more careful about that. But one way of opening that up is really uh, to read up about it and focus on Gharapagh is there. There are reading suggestions on YouTube below this recording. We hope you follow them up. We will be back in a week on Friday. Thank you for following and thank you for helping inform those who are in a position to make change. At the end of the day, that's what we do at the university and at the Institute of Armenian Studies. Thanks for watching.